right, so it seems like everything's ready to go. So welcome everyone to today's Behind the Science, a Wednesday web chat. Um, and during this series, we get to take a closer look at the people behind the science. I'm Madeline Arancivia from the Outreach and Engagement Team, and I'm your host. And today joining us, we also have Amanda Nickerson, our Director of Development. Hi, everyone. And also um, Dr. Jim Sullivan, our Executive Director. Hey, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us today. So uh, we're going to dive right in. Today's chat features Steve Burton. Steve is the director of the FAU Harbor Branch Marine Mammal Stranding and Population Assessment Team. He's been at Harbor Branch for 10 years, and he has over 23 years of experience working with dolphins, whales, seals, and sea lions in both Florida and Hawaii. His primary responsibility here at Harbor Branch is to make sure that our rescue team, population staff, and volunteers are always ready to help a marine mammal if there's any issues at any time. So um, a quick reminder for anyone who's new to joining us here on Zoom, if you have any questions during these chats, then you can go ahead and click on that button in the bottom middle of your screen that says Q&A. You'll type your question in there and then we'll ask Steve as many questions as we have time for today. So uh, just send your questions on over and we'll uh, get started. So Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having me. We're so happy to have you. Um, so I kind of want to just start at the beginning. What inspired you to pursue working with marine mammals for your career? Wow, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I grew up in Southern California and I'm very fortunate that I lived by the beach. Uh, when I was growing up, I lived down in San Diego for a while. And I want to thank my mom because she would always take us after school with a season pass to SeaWorld San Diego. So we always got to see one exhibit before going home and doing our homework. So I think that's the original aspect of how I wanted to get working with marine mammals, depending on dolphins, whales, or otters, or sea lions, just growing up as a little kid and being surrounded by it. And then um, I moved, as I got older, um, we lived in uh, Ventura County in Southern California. And being a middle schooler and high schooler, the natural progression is being a surfer, especially living in California. So I was always at the beach and I was always fascinated by it, about all the animals that you would see. And I wanted a job that kept me near the ocean and working with marine mammals and that's how I kind of dwarfed into it <laughs> so to speak just being in the environment and having it around me and growing up in that environment. I feel like that's the story for so many people and honestly SeaWorld is such a great inspiration it opens your eyes to so many things that you wouldn't necessarily see so I understand that for sure. <laughs> um, so how did you get to where you are now in your career? What was sort of your progression? Wow. Oh, wow. 23 years. <laughs> well, growing up in California, um, I went to school in Southern California. And at one of my community colleges, I saw a bulletin go to school in Hawaii and for the summer, do a summer uh, semester. Um, so I filled out the little brochure back then because it wasn't on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, sent it in and I applied for University of Hawaii Hilo and I took about four classes in the summertime. I'd never been to Hawaii before. I always wanted to go there being a surfer. I wanted to live there and I figured hey, I might as well try that you know and see what's going on with school and during my time there there was an, um, a dolphin facility um, similar to SeaWorld on the Kona side of the Big Island of Hawaii. And we had a field trip for our marine mammal class over there. And at the end of our field trip, they let the students know that um, they were looking for interns. And so I applied and I was fortunate to be an intern, one of six that they selected to um, 
they were having baby dolphins being born. So baby, uh, basically I was a baby watcher six days a week, eight hours a day. And the company got to see who I was, my personality, how I worked with everybody and their crew. And I flew back home and back to California. And the next day they called me up and said, why didn't you tell us you wanted to be a dolphin trainer? So I told the staff, but I didn't tell the bosses, you know, cause I was nervous and naive back then. And so um, they said, let us think about it. And sure enough, they offered me a job. So, wow. So I moved out to Hawaii. Um, back in 1997 to be a dolphin trainer at this great park. And um, I got to work for that company for eight years. And I did go to University of Hawaii Hilo for a little bit. And, um, and then after that, I moved to Oahu to join another company. Um, that got me my sea lion experience in seals as well as dolphins. And then I also got to finish my college as well. So I ended up graduating from Hawaii Pacific University. And um, during that whole time of being a dolphin trainer, a sea lion trainer for 13 years, um, I also helped with the wild animals, monk seals, the random stranded cetacean, uh, which is a dolphin or whale, and helping that way. And as you get in the dolphin training field, you start to morph a little bit and uh, as you move up, and back in 2009, a job opportunity came here at Harbor Branch and I applied for it. And in 2010, I got the job and I moved here. I think my starting date for 10 years, I think is April 26. So it's just around the corner. Oh, wow. I've been here 10 years and um, I wanted to be more with strandings and progress that way. Um, and the neatest perk of joining the Harbor Branch team um, and FAU was the ability to carry on with my education. So I actually got my master's degree uh, through FAU while working here. I did it at nighttime, um, online. That's <laughs> while trying to keep my job. So that's kind of the Steve Jobs in, <laughs> in a nutshell. <laughs> you know, everyone has a path and I feel like most people, it's not necessarily the conventional one that you would expect where it's just like, did this, this, this college grad school job. It's always these meandering things that open your eyes to something new or whatever it might be. But along yeah. all of that way, what would you say is the weirdest job that you've ever had? Wow, uh, weirdest jobs. I think I've had a lot of normal jobs and, <laughs> um, you know, just like any normal, normal American, you know, I, my first job was at McDonald's great job, learn customer service, uh, learn what it's to earn a paycheck <laughs> and have, have a boss that's not your parents. <laughs> um, I worked at a supermarket, gas station. I wouldn't call those weird, but those were my jobs. And then I ended up being a dolphin trainer um, and working a couple of marine parks, like I mentioned in here. Um, weird things that people might think that are weird, you know, when you're working with marine mammals in a human care facility, you know, you're sorting out fish every morning, clean, you know, making sure they get the right diet. For most people, they don't understand that, you know, if you have a population of 15 dolphins, uh, you got to sort through all the fish and get rid of the bad fish and only give them the good fish. That's weird. You smell like fish all the time. It's really attractive after hours when you're not working. <laughs> the showers you got to take. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. Well, I, I guess sorting fish is a pretty unique job, if not weird. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, it's something important to know if you want to get into that field, but that's a big part of it. <laughs> Um, so right. your career has taken you all sorts of places. You said you were in Hawaii for more than eight years. You were at one facility for eight years and another facility after that. What is the coolest place that you've ever been for work? For work? Um, well, one of the companies I worked with had a facility in Tahiti. Um, so I actually worked in Tahiti for about three weeks back in 2000, and that place was amazing on the island of Morea. So again, doing dolphin training, a human care facility with trained dolphins. Um, the surf was amazing. I thought Hawaii <laughs> surf was amazing, but um, the surf in Tahiti, at least on the island of Morea, was just absolutely fabulous. 
Um, I've, I've worked in Bermuda for the same company, both, oh, I've worked on Oahu and Hawaii, Hawaii uh, trips for work. I've given a presentation in, in Hong Kong uh, a few years ago. Um, so those are pretty cool places I've been to. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna ask, you've mentioned surfing a bunch of times. Are you still an avid surfer? I try to be. It's a little hard being the director right now, but I'm um, going to try to make up for that time <laughs> in the near future, especially with the beaches closed right now. So yeah. we're yeah. all not supposed to be in the water till the governor clears that. So hopefully at the end of April. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully. Fingers crossed that everybody stays safe and we can get through yeah. this hump. Um, so you've done the human care work and you've also done rescue work, which is primarily uh, what you've been doing at Harbor Branch for the last many years. Um, have there been any interesting animals that you've encountered through that rescue work that you wouldn't normally encounter? Yeah, um, you know, obviously um, dolphins, are, we see them all the time. They're in the Indian River Lagoon. Um, they're our number one strander. They're the number one animal that we do respond to. Um, unique animals, um, um, you know, we have humpback whales that migrate by during the winter. We also have North Atlantic right whales that come down to Florida. So we've got to work with those in the past and this year. Um, we actually had a North Atlantic right whale mom and calf um, give birth in December of 2019. So this calving season. They actually swam by Jensen Beach and Harbor Branch um, President's Day heading south and went all the way into the Gulf of Mexico into the panhandle for spring break and then turned around. And um, they were did go around the Keys a couple weeks ago and started heading back up to their feeding grounds um, just recently. They were last spotted off North Carolina earlier this week. So... Not, it's uh, very rare that North Atlantic right whales will go around the Keys to the Gulf. It happens once every, I don't know, 10 years or so. Um, but this mom just decided to go in the Gulf, show her kid that, hey, this is the Gulf of Mexico, and then turn back around. And now she's heading back up to the North Atlantic for the feeding grounds. So that's pretty cool. Um, other stranding uh, animals, uh, pilot whales. Um, we've had multiple mass strandings since I've been here 10 years. One locally um, here at Fort Pierce in 2012. So we did some rehabilitation work with them and those pilot whales, uh, pilot whales I'm sorry, went off to uh, Orlando SeaWorld. Um, we had uh, pilot whales down in the Keys as well that we helped. And um, other unique animals, spinner dolphins. Uh, we had a couple strain in the Keys a few years ago. And if any of you have seen our marine mammal ambulance at the education outreach events, our crew um, transported two spinner dolphins in the back of that ambulance in 2016 uh, from the Key Largo area, from one of our stranding partners, all the way to SeaWorld Orlando. So that was pretty cool. So an animal species you don't really get to see a lot. They're, you know, they're offshore, but not close to shore. So. Okay, well, pretty special experiences then. Also, that sounds like a very long drive with a <laughs> dolphin in the back of the truck. Yeah, you got to drive slow. And um, yeah, it was a long day, but well worth it. Yeah. Um, so you've mentioned a couple unique experiences, sort of unexpected things. Uh, have you ever had an unintended or unexpected result that led to something exciting? Some sort of special thing that you remember being interesting or yeah we had um um i'm not sure if the well the people that may be online right now that live locally they may remember uh clipper the north atlantic right whale that came into sebastian inlet in um february 2016. so our job is unique um it's variable uh, we do have a baseline of the work that we do do on a daily basis and then it's just random. So we got a call in the morning, same with National Marine Fisheries and Florida Fish and Wildlife, that um, Clipper, a North Atlantic right whale mom and her calf, decided to swim underneath the uh, A1A causeway into Sebastian Inlet. 
And so that was unique. And she decided to spend 36 hours um, milling around, trying to figure her way out. And again, she was just at the base of the inlet. She didn't go all the way into the ICW portion. But our team, along with the other stranding groups in our area, all were in a support mode. And we kind of just watched her and kept our distance. And then the next morning, um, she, she and her calf decided to uh, swim back out, which was a good thing. <laughs> and then about six months later, a group up in the Bay of Fundy that do North Atlantic right whale um, research spotted her, her and her calf. So they did make it up there. So those are kind of a unique story. You know, it's, oh, it's kind of odd to get a call. Hey, we have a whale and a calf in Sebastian Inlet. <laughs> Definitely unexpected. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a happy result. So that's all. Yeah, that was good. Exactly. Does that have to do like with tides or anything? Do you guys know? Was there anything that might have been an indication of why they decided to leave then? Um, not really certain um, for that yet. Um, the tide was running in. So a fisherman on Sebastian Inlet was fishing and got his cell phone. And if you've seen any of my presentations before, um, I have that video clip. And so they were just following the tide in and went under the causeway. And then I, you know, again, not to anthropomorphize, but I think she realized that now she's in shallow water because she did kind of flim get flimsy in the shallow water. And she did make several attempts to leave, but the tide at Sebastian Inlet is pretty strong coming in and out. Um, so it wasn't until the next day when the tide shifted to go out um, that she went through. And it was really interesting case because every time she came up to the causeway and we videotaped this, um, when she saw the shadow of the bridge, she, the mother would turn. Now, again, I don't know why. Maybe she was hearing stuff. I don't know why she would turn. But on one of the passes, I think it was the 14th or 15th try that she was trying to leave, the calf with the current got swept past that bridge shadow. And being a good mother, she followed her calf out. And everybody that was there, the public, the agencies, the, we were all cheered as we watched them swim out and then uh, head north. So that was pretty cool. So. That's amazing. So something that I have learned during this brief conversation is that North Atlantic right whale moms like to take their calves on adventures. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, so next question that I've got, um, what do you think is the most fascinating thing about the ocean that most people don't know? Hmm, good question. Oh, wow. Well, I think the neat thing here is when you're giving presentations or education outreach, a lot of people just go, we have whales in Florida. And so, you know, that's one of the coolest things to, I know I just touched over it, but again, a lot of people, you know, just don't know that. They just think, oh, whales are up in the North Atlantic. They're not here. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we have the humpbacks and the North Atlantic right whales in the winter, usually from December through late March and then they're gone, but we have whales year round. And um, that can be small whales and large. And a large being, uh, I would consider your sperm whales, they're year round. Um, and then your smaller whales, pilot whales, uh, pygmy sperm whales, stuff like that. So I would still class them as a small whale. So it's kind of cool. I love telling people that about the ocean, especially for Florida. But not in the lagoon, except for those very special cases. Yeah, <laughs> offshore, yes, correct. <laughs> offshore, not in, we don't want them in the lagoon. <laughs> Just dolphins. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, so uh, the next one that I've got here is, would you be able to share a defining moment from your career, something that really set you off on that new path? Well... Wow, that's a good question. Um, well, I'll kind of give you an oversight a little bit, you know, um, doing an internship, uh, take, taking a leap of faith and moving, you know, going to school in Hawaii for the summer. I mean, you know, you're always coming back home, you know, so that was kind of a defining path. But then getting the job in Hawaii and packing up everything and moving to Hawaii and then living there for 13 years 
and being in love with your, your several Marine Park jobs that I had there over the 13 years and loving Hawaii. And then, you know, coming here to Harbor Branch, everybody asked me, why did you move to Florida? And I was like, well, it's for work. Um, I've lived at the best three beach states, in my opinion, California, Hawaii, and Florida. Uh, maybe not all in that order. Obviously, most people that know me, or if you get the impression from this video, obviously I hold Hawaii in my heart, even though I'm born and raised in California. Um, so, you know, when I took the job, I packed up all my stuff in Hawaii and went and saw my folks in Southern California, picked up, I shipped my truck over and I drove Interstate 10 by myself with three surfboards, a few bags of clothes and moved all the way here. So defining path, it took me four days by myself, but I made it and so, you know, just have to do, you have to do what you have to do. <laughs> yeah, well, so actually that leads into the next question. What advice would you give for someone who's thinking about pursuing marine mammal work as a career? Like what are those touchstone things that you think are best? Gotcha. Well, first of all, um, make sure you go to school and make sure you get a four year degree in science um, zoology, biology, even psychology. I always tell people, um, you know, uh, good school teachers would be excellent dolphin trainers, marine animal trainers. Um, I recommend um, volunteering, maybe with Fish and Wildlife, you know, FWC, um, as a volunteer while you're going to school. Um, if you're over 18, you can always apply to be a volunteer with us and get to see if you actually like it. Um, you know, it is an unpredictable job. Um, I've painted a rosy picture, <laughs> you know, the strainings, the rescues, but the other side of the job is that we have to realize that marine mammals at times die um, and we have to do necropsies. So not everybody would like to do that. You know, necropsies, the animal version of a human autopsy where we, have to dissect that animal and we're trying to find cause of death. Um, and a lot of the times that what, what, that's what we're actually dealing with is a lot of um, animals that strand and they just don't make it, you know? So the rescues are the great things. But going back to your original question there is, you know, getting a volunteership, uh, getting a job, maybe at a Marine park. And the reason I mentioned that is because you're gonna get 40 hours a week at least animal exposure with marine mammals. And you're gonna learn animal behavior. You're gonna learn husbandry and how to look after those animals. And even though they have the best care in the world, sometimes those animals do get sick and you learn how to take care of them and bring them back to a healthy state. And so what I learned over 13 years is the marine mammal field is all those little nooks and behavioral aspects of the marine mammal to pay attention to wild animals and all that stuff and apply that. So how we apply to human care with marine mammals in marine parks is how we do it again with the wild animals in that care. And you, you need to, in the stranding field um, on your resume um, for article three and four with National Marine Fisheries, prove that you've done re uh, rescues or strandings, get that experience prove that you've done necropsies and you can do that on hand training, uh, but you can also do it as a volunteer and you just got to build up that time. And so again, for those that are looking for that way, you can always email me and I can answer even more and give you more advice. And we've had a few volunteers here in my 10 years here that have gone on, started off at 18 as a volunteer while they're at school. Um, finished school and graduated and worked at various marine parks here throughout Florida. And some of them have moved on to um, stranding facilities too. And again, that's the best recommendation. Okay, uh, definitely good advice. I know I have met people throughout the years who work uh, with marine mammals and uh, internships, uh, unpaid internships, volunteers, you know, all of those things, it might not be the most fun uh, or most financially feasible, but it's definitely the way to uh, get people to know you, so. In, in some places now, interns get a stipend or get a pay 
So it's changed since I first started. <laughs> lucky, lucky them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so another quick reminder for all of our guests that if you guys think of any questions that you want to ask Steve, you can go ahead and use that Q&A button on the middle bottom of the screen. Um, and I'll go through some of those questions a little bit later on during our chat. Um, so uh, what type of trainings have you done in order to be where you are at this stage in your, your career? Wow, um, a lot. <laughs> Um, I mentioned the background with school, um, but here working, um, our facility is at a university, so we obviously have safety classes to take um, um, because we do work in labs and work with chemicals. Um, and so we do have a lot of safety classes that we have to keep up on a, a yearly basis. Sometimes a couple years we have to refresh them. Uh, we are, uh, we do take a HAZWOPER class. That's not part of the university, um, but that's a certification that when we first take, it's a 24 hour course. And then we renew it every year for an eight hour course. And that allows our straining team members, including myself, if we've taken the course to go into an oil environment for an oil spill as a first responder for marine life. So um, we do have that as a training, you know, like I mentioned 24 hours, um, and then eight hours. We have a lot of boating experience and we work through our small boats marine manager here at Harbor Branch um, and take an MOCC Coast Guard class so we can drive boats, launch boats, um, get trained to go offshore. We have a 24 foot rib boat that we use with large whales offshore. And as I mentioned with large whales, um, some of our staff members are trained to work with large whales. We're on uh, Nashreen Fisheries Large Whale Disentanglement Permit, which is different than our um, photo ID permit or stranding permit. Um, it's a separate one that you have to be recommended to be on and show an interest of um, and a need for that. So we do have a couple of employees, including myself, on that permit. And that allows us to, uh, when called upon, um, by National Marine Fisheries and the Stranding Coordinators and um, uh, to go out and check on large whales, humpbacks, photo document them, get close to them. And that's the thing that I do wanna make clear with our rescue work as well, is having those permits. There's laws, we can't just go handle a dolphin or a whale, you have to have permits to do that. So for the public, you do need to be 50 feet away from a dolphin, 100 feet away from a large whale and 500, uh, uh, feet away from uh, North Atlantic right whale, but having these permits allows us and having that training to approach them. Uh, but most of the time we can stay our distance with our, our cameras. We've got cameras that have got super long lenses and we can zoom right into the animals and document them. So those are some of the neat trainings that we do have for large whales or in general, just for the job itself. That's awesome. And I'm sure for some of those trainings, uh, you can find ways to learn more, even if you don't already have that job lined up. Right. And, you know, depending on what level you are with the large whales and getting that experience, um, you know, we do the, the leaders in large whale disentanglement are based at a coastal center studies up in um, Provincetown. So once you reach um, qualify for level three, you get sent up there and learn from the best. They've been doing it for 30, 40 years, disentangling large whales. I was very fortunate to learn from them in September of 2012. So I am a level three um, large whale disentanglement person, which means I can, with permission from National Marine Fisheries, if we have an entangled large whale, again, with permission, we can put telemetry buoys on the track them um, and go through there. Did so, you lose me there? Or no? uh, I think I think we're good. We just had a little lag for a second, but hopefully we're good now. Um, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully I answered the training question there. Yeah, no, you did for sure. Uh, probably my most difficult question for you. If you uh -oh. didn't work with marine mammals, what career do you think you'd have? Ooh, wow. Uh, oh, I haven't thought about that in a long time because dolphins and whales always keep me busy. 
Um, if I could go back in time, <laughs> um, you know, um, as a kid growing up and my mom will vouch it for me, uh, as a young kid, I wanted to be a Navy fighter pilot. Um, I love the blue angels. In fact, uh, whenever they're in town, I always wish I could fly in the back of one of those jets, you know, be the lucky news reporter that gets to fly with them just to feel that rush. Um, and then in high school, before I decided I wanted to get into marine mammals, I thought I would be like a surgeon or a doctor. And, um, but again, I'm very, I'm happy what, how it all turned out. I'm really yeah. fortunate that I get to come to work every day and know that I may get to work with a dolphin, uh, may get to work with a whale today. <laughs> uh, FWC may ask for help with a manatee and we may go help them. Um, so those are the cool things, but again, going back in time, maybe a fighter pilot, you know, uh, or a, a surgeon would be pretty cool. Definitely all careers that include some brief but intense moments of adrenaline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so what do you think is the coolest thing about dolphins or whales specifically? Mm. That's, wow. I got some toughies. <laughs> yeah, you do. Well, I always like watching, you know, again, when it sound a little corny here, maybe, or whatever. Um, again, growing up, I always liked watching the dolphins surf the waves. And it just looked, again, not to anthropomorphize, it just looked like they were having the best of times, you know. Um, and I think when we're out here working and the dolphins are swimming in the river, you know, it just seems like they're just swimming aimlessly, and, you know, and gracefully. And then with whales, um, I just, um, you know, how large they are <laughs> is one thing that just amazes me. And I love hearing the sound of a large whale when they exhale, you know, you know, that big old breath of air. Yeah. So I guess that's it. <laughs> Lots of cool things that you can see and experience with them. Uh, what would you say are some common misconceptions about marine mammals? Gotcha. Hmm. Well, you know, some people, they see them out in the river and they go, oh, look, it's a healthy dolphin. You know, um, you know it's a free swimming dolphin. Uh, you can't check its health unless it's stranded <laughs> and we're able to take a sample from it or if you have a health assessment. Um, so you can't just check, you, just by seeing an animal, you can't just say, oh, that's a healthy swimming dolphin. So that's one misconception, you know, because it's just like somebody sees me on TV today, they may go, oh, look, Steve looks healthy, but I may have a cold. <laughs> Hope not during this time, but, <laughs> you know, so, but you know what I'm saying on that. So that's a misconception. Um, you know, people always think that dolphins always want to be together. Well, certain species do of dolphins do hang out in large groups offshore. Um, but um, they're just like people at times when we're out there on the river looking at them. Sometimes they're in groups. Sometimes they're all by themselves. And um, it's just like us. We may be socially distancing right now <laughs> and then grouping back up and then we go to another room just to have some downtime. So that's another misconception that, you know, oh, it's a lonely single dolphin by itself. You know, maybe it wanted to be by itself. That's a good point. Uh, so I know our community, like many people, enjoys going out and seeing dolphins uh, in the wild and so what can our community do to get involved in helping us understand and protect marine mammals? Well, just remember, uh, well, first of all, since you said marine mammals, just remember in um, manatee zones, obey them, um, go slow, watch out for the manatees, they need love too. And then for dolphins and whales, just remember that um, it's really cool to see them give them their space, you know, the law 50 feet away. So if you're out on your boat in the river, local community, and you see a dolphin, just give them their space. If you're fishing, um, please just pull up your line, check your cell phone, text your loved ones, have lunch, 
um, have a beverage, and when the dolphins swim past you, then throw your fishing line back out and have a great time fishing. And then if you ever see a dolphin or if you're at the beach and you see a whale that you think that could be in distress, uh, there are hotlines, and um, the best one for the state of Florida is the Fish and Wildlife Hotline, FWC, and that's 888-404-3922. And I'll say it again, 888-404-3922. And there's an operator on that phone line 24-7 every day of the year. And that also works for any animal in Florida. So it doesn't just have to be manatees, dolphins, or whales. So again, if you see something and you're not sure, call it into that number and tell them where you were, what time, what the animal was, how many, and they will contact the local straining group and get somebody out there to check it out. That could be for birds as well, bobcats, turtles, you name it. And that's the best way. You don't have to be a volunteer. You're just being a concerned citizen and basically doing citizen science and you're helping out. Um, our team's not always out on the water. And so we rely on the public's information. And if you call us, we will go look and um, check it out. Uh, if you could get us a photo um, with your cell phone or a video, um, that would be great. The more information, the better. Um, because that helps us with our resources and getting people involved. Awesome. So you had mentioned citizen science. Um, citizen <laughs> science is definitely a really great way for the community to get involved. And you have a citizen science project that's available at Harbor Branch, right? Yes, you can find it on our website and it's a offshore citizen science project. And all the details are on there. Um, but we're working with um, Sea Keepers Group. Um, and what we're asking for is if you're offshore fishing or boating and you see dolphins or whales, we're looking for the GPS location, time, date, how many animals. And again, please res be responsible dolphin and whale watching. Keep your distance. Don't chase them. <laughs> you know, you don't have to get all the details. If you didn't get a photo, that's okay. Because um, I do don't want to break any laws or rules. But we just want to know where certain animals are so we can work on some research in the future and get the correct permits to do that. Um, we're also working in, um, it's been on hold for a couple of weeks now with what's going on in our society and hopefully that ends in a few months but we'll be talking to you and gabby and i want to make a land-based citizen science for those people that don't have boats that um can record where they saw a dolphin you know you're walking barber's bridge um we want to know what time did you see them and how many and so that way you're not even on a boat you're not near a dolphin but you can report and we may find out that in people's back canals Dolphins are hanging out there that we didn't even know. And that's, that just adds more to the research and the science and data and going um, to add to our population assessment side, doing something different than just surveys um, and trying to, so, and the public can help us. That would be awesome. So stay tuned for that. Uh, <laughs> no pressure on my side and my team's <laughs> side to get it up and talk to you and Gabby. Surprise to let it out of the bag. <laughs> But you know, um, we're always brainstorming and always trying to be ahead of the curve. <laughs> and it gives people something to look forward to. So definitely keep checking back with us to find out when that's ready to launch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if you could give your younger self some career advice, what would you have told yourself back at the beginning? Wow. That's really good. Good question. I never thought of that. Um, well, I don't think I'd really change anything. I've had some amazing life experiences. Um, I've been to some amazing places. I've worked with amazing people. Um, I'm learning every day. Um, and, um, I'm still learning today. I need, a, I get to work with some amazing people, not only at Harbor Branch, but with other stranding groups. Um, and like I said, I get to learn. So if, uh, again, I guess if I could go back in time and tell my younger self, um, you know, just keep learning, <laughs> you 
you know, just keep learning and enjoy the ride, <laughs> you know, and I think that's what I would tell myself. Always good advice. There's something new to learn every day. Exactly. I just learned Zoom yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> always, always a good thing to expand those skills. <laughs> Well, that covers all of my questions that I had. Um, so we're gonna get into some of the questions from you guys, our audience. So again, another reminder, um, if you have questions, definitely keep asking them, use that Q and A button and we'll try and uh, get through um, as many as we can now. So this first one that I've got at the top here, what is your favorite animal that you've worked with so far? Wow. Um, I guess it could be species or specific animal in your case. <laughs> um, I'll give you two, two versions. Um, uh, human care, um, a few of my dolphins that I will always remember, Pele, Kona, Eva, Lono, uh, and Poliahu. Those are some of the dolphins that I've worked with in human care. I learned a lot from them. And over time, it's like having a dog and you work on a relationship and you get a bond with that animal. So it's really cool for that way, um, especially after working at a marine park for many, many years and earning that respect with that individual animal and remembering how they didn't trust me when I first started and now they do. So that was really cool having a relationship with the animal. Um, so those are dolphins. <laughs> Um, and the question was my favorite animal species. Sure, yeah. My favorite animal species, I think, are humpback whales. Um, and again, the reason why, and again, sounds weird since I always seem to work with dolphins more than anything. Um, and I love dolphins and growing up with them. But the reason I liked humpback whales is you would get so excited when you lived in Hawaii, knowing that they were migrating for the winter and coming. And then the news would have the first humpback whale of the season has been spotted off Maui late October, November. And so every time you'd go to the beach on the big island of Hawaii or Oahu, you'd be looking, looking for that spout, hoping that you'd finally get to see them, you know, and that anticipation. And then um, when they're there, you know, they've got the long pectoral flippers, they're white, white pectoral, and they sl tail slap, they peck slap, and then they've got that beautiful breach where they jump, take their whole body out of the water. So I think that's why I like humpback whales. Mm -hmm. um, they also come to give birth to baby whales. So you get to see the babies too. And then they're gone. They leave March and head back up to Alaska and you've got to wait. <laughs> and I think it's that anticipation of waiting nine months. So I just really like humpback whales. That's my favorite whale and favorite animal. Good choice. For sure. Um, so we've got sort of a two-parter here. Uh, what is the most challenging thing about your current job and what's the most rewarding? Oh, all right. Challenging. Um, challenging is having something planned for the weekend <laughs> and you're on call. And for those that don't understand that is with our permits, uh, we respond to Indian River, St. Lucie, Martin County, dolphin and whale strainings. And so we spread out the on-call time, but you may have wanted to go out to dinner and a movie and you get a call about an animal and you have to put everything on your life on hold and go respond to that animal. Maybe it's six o'clock on a Saturday night or holiday. I've worked on Christmas many days um, and it just, it is what it is. That's challenging. Uh, also challenging is the weather. Florida, as we know, the heat, the humidity, um, thunderstorms in the summer come out of nowhere. So human safety is key. Um, so those are challenging as well. And what was the second part of the question? What's the most rewarding part? Oh, the most rewarding. Well, as I mentioned, we do, you do, uh, the necropsies are hard on everybody. Um, but rewarding for me is um, working a case for like an entangled dolphin in the river and locating that entangled dolphin, uh, documenting all that, and working with National Marine Fisheries and our straining partners, and forming an, what we call an intervention group where everybody gets together, and we go rescue that animal, disentangle it, 
and let it go back out to the wild. And then six months later, you're on the boat doing research or boat maintenance work and you recognize that dolphin fin and you're like, oh my goodness, that's so-and-so, so-and-so. Oh yeah. And it just puts a good, ha a good smile on your face. You know, job well done or whale done, no pun intended. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. I do love puns, so that really helps. <laughs> um, so um, the next question is, what was the focus of your master's degree? The focus of my master's degree, well, my undergrad work was environmental studies, and FAU um, didn't have that program as a major, so I did environmental science, and I did the non-thesis version, and that's where I got my master's of science in environmental science. So... Um, at this current time, I don't plan on working on my PhD. <laughs> so I went the route that was best for me in my career path. So I, I passed on the thesis version. Doesn't mean I can't go back, but at this current time, I'm just focused on being the director of the Straining and Population Assessment Team. I'm sure you have your hands full. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the next question is, would you describe a somewhat typical process that occurs when you get a call for a stranding? Whew. All righty. Well, usually um, the public, find, public is our first person on scene. They're out enjoying their day on the river or walking the beach. Sometimes it's the turtle patrols as well, so other agencies. Um, and we'll get the call either um, there's, it'll either come through National Marine Fisheries Hotline, Fish and Wildlife's Hotline, or sometimes people just call Harbor Branch, but we prefer you use one of the hotlines to call it in. Um, we have a phone app for us, a phone number that the Stranding Network has. So that way one of the team members here has, um, is uh, on call for the week. They'll receive that call We'll take down the notes of description. We'll contact uh, the caller, get more information. And depending on what the situation is, is how we'll gather our resources. We also contact um, uh, several other administration uh, members here at Harbor Branch, including our communications team, um, our um, executive director. Um, and that way they know um, and as well as our veterinarians that we're out in the field working. So there's not a surprise call. Hey, did you know that the rescue team's working with three dolphins? You know, surprise. So we have protocols for that. And that way they can do their job behind scenes and we can focus on what we do best. And we can bypass all that other stuff. We also stay in contact with the National Marine Fisheries Stranding Coordinator. And that's the same thing. We, they are doing all the lifting behind scenes so that when we arrive on scene, we can communicate with them and say, hey, we do have a live dolphin here and they've already done their work while we were responding. And as the vet, our veterinarian diagnosed the animal on scene, hey, this animal may be a candidate for rehab and the National Marine Fisheries Stranding Coordinator has already found a location for us to transport that animal. So it's a unique um, system that we're all working together at once and we all play our role in that team to eliminate so many hoops that we have to jump through. Basically, it's like an incident command system, you know, and that way when you make that call to somebody, they've already got the answer for you. Perfect. You know, hey, Harbor Ranch team, this little baby dolphin can be transported to so-and-so and so-and-so. Are you guys able to do that? Yes, we are. We're on our way, you know, and then they can coordinate to that aquarium or zoo, wherever that animal's going. And that, that's, so hopefully answered that question. <laughs> yeah, that process. How many people are typically called out? So I know you have a team of volunteers that you can tap into if you need help. Good question. Uh, well, we have on uh, our staff, um, we have three first responders, including myself. We have a few starting in a, a few extra staff members starting in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have our head veterinarian, Dr. Annie Page Cargin, and we have a backup vet. So there's five of us right there. So not all of us always respond. Uh, but going on the water with FAU policies, we always need two people on the boat. 
So we need a minimum of two on the boat. And depending on the scene, if it's a live animal or dead animal, that will depend on, and the size of the animal and species will depend on how many staff members will go. Some staff may be on vacation and not able to attend or out of town. We do have volunteers. Uh, we have over 21 volunteers currently, and they volunteer on an on-call basis. Um, currently, with what's going on with coronavirus and the rules and policies, um, we do not have any volunteers at Harbor Branch, or, and they cannot help us out in the public right now. So it's just strictly the Harbor Branch team. But when this all ends, hopefully sooner than later, um, our volunteers will be back working with us. And that could lead to, um, if we had a mass stranding, we'd like all our volunteers. Um, if it's just one or two animals, you know, typically we have five volunteers show up to help us. And if all of them show up, that's great too. I'll make sure they all have something to do. The more the merrier. Yeah. That's good. We work a lot with the public. Um, like I said, we'll, when we arrive on scene, we pass out PPE and we communicate with them, even if they've never been with a dolphin or whale, they're excellent help. And we educate while we're working. And then we always thank them. We thank the public for calling in. Thank for helping us in the uh, field. We can't do it without the public's help. Yeah, that's awesome. Another citizen science opportunity. <laughs> hearing and uh, helping out in that way. Um, the next question here is, um, do you work with or combine data with NOAA? Yes, that's an excellent question. Um, we fill out what's called, for our strainings, we fill out what's called a 24-hour report. It goes in a database with National Marine Fisheries. So that means 24 hours after the event, we need to turn that document in. And it's a one or two page document. We also share that with our straining partners for communication. It keeps them in the loop of what's happening nearby or on the other side of the state. Um, that way we can help them if they need to. Um, it go, this 24 hour report does go on a NOAA database. And if anybody's interested in that data, they can contact National Marine Fisheries and there's some data that they're allowed to have from that. And there's a lot of grad students and uh, undergrads and scientists that do approach NOAA for that data to do uh, research on because that is public data. Um, for necropsies, we fill out what's called a level A report, and that is a detailed report of what we've done on the necropsy, what samples we have, and that is also inputted into a national database with NOAA, and the public can, again, can get some data from that as well. And again, you have to ask permission through National Marine Fisheries. We're working under a permit through National Marine Fisheries that allows us to work with marine mammals. And so ultimately they're the key holder of the data. And then we have our own research on the side that we're working on. Um, somebody, next question here is asking if you advise any graduate students at FAU. No, I'm not faculty. So that's an excellent question. Um, but if any of the grad students at FAU would like to work with a faculty member um, and they have an interest in a marine mammal project, I can definitely um, uh, advise and coach them on a day-to-day -day basis. But per rules, um, you need to be a faculty member, which I'm not. But that's okay. And again, if anybody would like to do that in the future, we'd love to have that. And that's okay. Awesome. Um, next question here, um, if you can uh, think the, of them off the top of your head, what mentors were most helpful to you in your career? Wow. Well, I want to say every single dolphin trainer that I worked with when I was, ever since I've ever worked, um, especially the older ones that when I first started and saw me when I was green and took time out of their day to just help me. Um, and teach me something. Um, and then all the trainers I worked with afterwards, because even though I may have had some experience, I was still learning. Um, and then for the straining sides, uh, mentors, um, Dr. Bob Braun in Hawaii, um, Dr. Brenda Jensen from HPU, she was a mentor for me for my undergrad. Um, uh, here at Harbor Branch, I'd like to thank Dr. Paul Wills 
He was my advisor for grad school, uh, took time out of his busy schedule and day um, to listen to me <laughs> and coach me and guide me and help me with my independent studies. Um, so those are some of the mentors um, that I'd like to thank. And then my team that I currently work with, that I'm, I'm learning every day. Um, and so I, I wanna thank them as well. All right, so the last question for today, um, you mentioned that you are a level three when it comes to large whale disentanglement. Uh, how many levels are there? Good question. There's actually five, um, and you can um, Google it online, um, National Marine Fisheries Large Whale Disentanglement Team, and they'll have all five levels. Level one is typically done online. It's for boaters. Um, a, if you see a whale offshore, report it. Um, level two is more in depth. Um, our coworker, Wendy Marks, just got that this past winter um, where she went up to Jacksonville with the um, air sur FWC air survey team, got a little more hands-on training, um, got a day on the water with the boat. Uh, level three, you actually go up to PC uh, Center of Coastal Studies in Provincetown and get a week's worth of large whale training. Level four is doing, dis again, you've got to learn. It's, you don't just jump right in. Hey, I got this training. I got to do this. Just being a support role is what you're going to start off as and observing no matter what level you are at. Um, and that would be disentangling your non-endangered whales. Um, and then level five is your endangered whales, high risk animals, like your North Atlantic right whales. So um, I can tell you, I will never be a level five <laughs> and I probably will never be a level four. And that's just building up your experience. Um, Harbor Branch, if you look at the map of the large whale disentanglement team members, if you uh, down the eastern seaboard, we're the last group. <laughs> and so we cover from Cape Canaveral to Miami area for large whales in that role. And again, as I mentioned, we're more in a photographic um, documenting, putting a telemetry buoy. And if it's not an endangered whale, um, and again, this is hypoth hypothetical, and we're the only group in there and it's approved by National Marine Fishery Large Whale, we may be able to cut. But again, so again, I, to be honest with you, I'll probably end up being just a level three and I'm okay with that. And that's just because I just won't get those opportunities because a lot of the entanglements happen in the North Atlantic region and that's where you're gonna get your opportunities a lot to build up your resume and have somebody go, you know what? we need to promote so-and-so, so-and-so to level four, you know, because they've shown they've done for hypothetically a hundred disentanglements. They've shown they put human safety first. So hopefully I, I gave you a, a long answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> but it's okay. just, it's really, we have a really unique job and rules and policies that we have to follow for safety, not only for the animal, but the number one safety is humans. Human safety comes first. And that's what you learn with large whales. We want to save them, but if you have to pull out and try again another day, that's what you're going to have to do. So. Well, thank you so much for all of the awesome information that you shared and for joining us on the chat today. We're so happy thank to have you. Very you. Much. Thanks for having me. I hope I made it entertaining for everybody. <laughs> Also, of course, thank you as always to our audience for providing some fantastic questions. We're so happy to have you involved in this program. Next week's Behind the Science will feature Dr. Greg O'Quarry Crow. Greg does work um, studying marine apex predators using uh, molecular techniques and also field ecology techniques. He has done work with polar bears uh, stellar sea lions, seals, and most recently he's been working with beluga whales. So we hope you'll zoom in next Wednesday, April 15th at 4 p.m. to hear more about his work. In the meantime, if you want to learn more about Harbor Branch, then please visit us online at www.fau.edu slash hboi where you can read more about our research, watch our archived ocean science lectures, and learn more about our programs. 
You can also find us on social media where you can see last week's Behind the Science with Dr. Shirley Pomponi in case you missed that. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you guys stay healthy and have a wonderful evening.